So a little bit about myself. Thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to talk about, um, I call it Azure Console, but it's Azure Cloud Shell. And some things that we can do with Azure Cloud Shell, it's obviously in Azure. Um, but uh, first and foremost about myself, my name is Steve Borsch. I work at Black Hills Information Security as a penetration tester, uh, red teamer, and I also do training and teaching through uh, AntiSiphon. Uh, it's a website that's on the screen right there. So be sure to check that out and we'll talk about that at the end. But uh, so I've been doing offensive work, uh, penetration testing since about 2014. Uh, so kind of graduated high school a little, or high school late in my life. Yeah, I graduated college, sorry, uh, a little bit late. Did the whole military thing before that and got my uh, network security degree and immediately got hired out uh, at uh, a company doing consulting here in Virginia, which is where I'm at right now. And just kind of been bouncing around uh, consultant work. I've done some internal red teaming work. I've taught at Black Hat, at B-Sides events, uh, private Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so kind of done a little bit of everything. So let's get started on Azure Cloud Shell, or as I call it, the Azure Console. So a little bit about the Azure Console, quick overview. Uh, so it is a shell uh, in Azure and you can either spin up Bash or PowerShell. Uh, so you have that uh, option there, which is great. Some people don't like PowerShell. I, on the other hand, absolutely love it. So some great things about Azure uh, Cloud Shell is you have some tools already pre-installed for you. Um, so you have different shells you can use, Bash, CSH, SH, uh, Tmux. I don't know why they put dig in here. Uh, so they have dig, uh, NSLOOKUP type things. Um, Azure tools specifically to Azure. So the Azure CLI, so you can interact with your virtual machines, deploy websites, um, talk to your uh, storage blobs, things like that. All built right into this awesome shell. Uh, you have text editors. So you have VS Code right in the web browser. So when you open uh, Cloud Shell in the browser, you can hit uh, the tab and I'll show this to you here momentarily, but uh, you can open up uh, editor right in there and edit your files in Linux or in the PowerShell terminal. Uh, so for you other uh, terminal fanatics, you've got the Vim, you've got the Nano, and you've got the Emacs. Uh, so uh, pick your poison there. Of course, you've got Git to uh, source control and download stuff from GitHub. Uh, tools to build. So this is great. You can uh, make and Maven, NPM, and PIP, uh, do all that fun stuff. Uh, build your tools in the Cloud Shell on the fly. Uh, also containers, it is containerized, so you can uh, you can deploy uh, Docker desktop, you can deploy your own Docker images and things like that. Uh, Kubernetes, connect to those can, uh, containers in Azure as well. Databases is a big thing. Uh, so from Azure Cloud Shell, you have uh, the client set up to connect to databases because Azure does have database features in it. So it kind of makes sense that you connect to them, and we'll talk about some security features and downfalls or uh, pitfalls with Azure uh, SQL, and uh, specifically one setting in there that uh, allows us to talk to it from different angles. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. And language support, so this is cool. We've got .NET Core, uh, Go, Java, Node.js, PowerShell, and Python. I do want to note that there are some caveats to Cloud Shell, like you can't get administrator access. I say you can't get, now all you're going to go out there and try to hack your way in to get administrator access and shit Cloud Shell or uh, root pseudo access. You can't do that, um, probably for reasons, right? So everything you have to do has to be in the user context. And anything outside of the home directory gets squashed every time you reboot the Cloud Shell. So. That can be uh, kind of annoying sometimes, so there's no real persistent uh, cloud storage. It does cost a couple pennies. Uh, it's not that expensive, but when you start the Azure Cloud Shell, it has to connect to some kind of storage. I have two Cloud Shells set up here, and I wanted to tell you uh, why at first. So on the left-hand side over here, you can see my mouse cursor. It's the one that's booting into Cloud Shell right now. Uh, this is, let's say, our target organization. So for me, it's futuresec.xyz, uh, futuresec being my, uh, my company for training and teaching. Uh, but futuresec.xyz has, let's say, a couple VMs in here. I'll talk about that. We've got a resource group, a webinar database, a proxy VM that we'll use. 
And then on the right hand side, I have my tenant. So you as the uh, adversary or attacker or red team or penetration tester with authorized um, uh, ability to hack your target, right? Um, let's say they have an Azure tenant and you wanna go after their databases, you wanna go after to get into their cloud and things like that, fish those uh, administrators. Um, well, you can do a lot of this from your own cloud shell as well. Like we can send fishes from our own cloud shell. And then if those fishes get banned, like our IP from cloud shell gets banned, we can go to sender.office.com and unban our own IP address. It's actually right here. So this Office 365 anti-spam IP delist portal so from Cloud Shell, if you were to send mail message to uh, an SMTP server and have that relay for you, uh, which we'll do here shortly, and it gets blocked by uh, Exchange Online Protection, you can just go here and request that it gets unblocked and automatically, automagically within a few minutes, uh, your IP is unbanned and you can fish again. Well, you can do that, or you can hit the little power button here and roll your uh, cloud shell and uh, get a new IP address. So that's the great thing about cloud shell is if you're proxying or pivoting or, or things like that, you can get a new IP address. About the IP address that you do get, it is an Azure space, so it's more reputable, right? More trusted. So if you have things going up or down, downloading, uploading, got traffic in the target network going to Azure, uh, it's a little more blends in, right? It's legitimate traffic. It's not um, not like DigitalOcean or, or some sketchy VPS out there that uh, attackers are hosting their stuff on. Uh, you can pivot to internal Azure space here, where I'm typing here, uh, there's a VNet located. Uh, that VNet uh, is attached to a couple virtual uh, uh, machines in there. I've got a proxy an Ubuntu proxy and a Windows VM. We're gonna, we're gonna show you what we can do with those. And you can also pivot to Azure SQL. You can do so, so there's like invoke SQL command right here. So we can write from Cloud Shell, interact with your Azure uh, SQL databases. Perfect. All right, so let's curl actually and see what kind of public IP address we get here. So curl if config. So on my left hand one, this is from a virtual network. This one is from our attacker uh, tenants. So you can see we're in the 20 range, uh, different um, octets after that. Um, but the local IP address in here is 10.244. And the local address here should be 10.0, yeah, 1.4. So that's on a virtual network. So these two can't talk to each other, right? This is my tenant, this is this tenant. But I'm gonna show you some things that can talk to each other from your tenant to the target tenant. So first and foremost, let's just say, uh, we talked about uh, Visual Studio Code being in here. So let's do code test.txt, right? Boom, there's your text editor, right, uh, right in the console. We can do, you know, make a PowerShell. We can do whatever, hello world. And then over here on the right, you can't see it because the screen's a little smushed, but there's three buttons and you can hit save or close editor. So you can save that and then you close that. And then our test document is there. You can also upload and download with the upload download picture right here, upload files to the shell, download files from the shell. You can even manage the file share. Another cool thing you can do is if you host like a web server or something in here, if you got like a little program running or whatever, you're hosting uh, something to test, you can do a web preview. You can click on this button, oh yeah, configure, and then you can open a port from Cloud Shell. Now this opens it locally for you to get access to. You can also open up your terminal, Azure or uh, Windows terminal. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of hard, it's a little small but there's Azure Cloud Shell right here as an option. If you click on that, it's gonna to go to the device code authentication, microsoft.com device login. If you're a fan of token tactics, the tool um, we wrote to fish cloud administrators and things like that, you'll know about the device login. It's legit, it's like signing into Netflix on your TV, right? You don't wanna type a bunch of stuff onto your TV. So it says, hey, go on your computer, go to this and enter this code. And you go to Netflix forward slash redeem, you put the code in there and then it logs you into your TV. 
Same thing here. So if you log into Microsoft device login with your Microsoft account, you enter the code, you're logged in. If you were the attacker, you could send this to that person and then access uh, Azure as them, right? So that would give you access to somebody else's console uh, potentially, or if you fish their credentials, right? Then a little bit about the IP address. So this is a previous shell I had. So 52, we can see it's a, it's a Microsoft IP address, right? Microsoft business uh, in Virginia. So it's probably pretty close to me here. And keep in mind when we're pivoting through this, you can do things like uh, spray with your password tool. So you're going to have a public uh, IP address from Azure to do things as. I did deploy VMs uh, in this instance, and I did so with a simple uh, VM command. So Azure VM or AZVM create, you can create a, a resource group, the name, demo proxy, and then the Ubuntu LTS. So I spun up an Ubuntu uh, VM, told it to use Azure Admin, generated me some SSH keys, blah, blah, blah. Now I had a VM spun up. So what I wanna do next is, can I hit those VMs from the target cloud shell? So this, and I'm gonna go ahead and say, all right, I know the IP address of the VM that's inside of their network. It is 10.0.4. So let's see if RDP is open. We did a net connect on that port. So RDP is open. And let's check 445. 445 is open and we can uh, validate that no other port like that. 446, there we go, connection refused. So got 3389, 445 open from this cloud shell. And pretty obviously, if we were to try to connect to a 10 address from another tenant, it's not gonna work. So let's do a reverse SSH tunnel from our, uh, actually let's do it from, yeah, well, in this case, we'll start from their target, uh, our target tenant. So let's say you have you EvilGenix2 fished a cloud admin and you have their session token and you're able to log into Azure Cloud Shell. But a boom, you're here. Now what? If you have the rights, you could spin up a VM in their cloud shell or you could uh, SSH to something else you own, another VPS, Vulture, DigitalOcean, uh, AWS, whatever, right? So you're going to put a reverse tunnel. That's what the R is here. We're going to pull traffic back into our cloud shell. So here I'm at on the demo proxy. And no, notice this is an Azure VM. We get a 20 address as well. This is important to note uh, because I am VPNed into DigitalOcean right now. And uh, so I've got a 142 endpoint there. Uh, so that's a public IP. And we're going to show you how um, some things don't work from public where they do from Cloud Shell. So we've got that and then from my local shell on my vm right so this isn't connect this isn't the internet this is my local vm here in my pc at home i'm going to ssh up to the same host i'm going to do a local port forward to port 9050 so then we're going to say hey anything on our local vm 9050 can tunnel out through to the cloud shell via the vm uh, in the middle there we go so now they're both SSH into the demo proxy. So now from my local Windows subsystem for Linux, I'm going to proxy chains and map, and that's over port 9050. Hits ST, so we're gonna do a full connect. Uh, we can't do SYN scan through proxy chains um, by default, so we'll do that. We'll look for those same ports and see if that uh, See if that server's up. So there we go. So through our Windows subsystem for Linux, well, actually from PowerShell, we SSH to a VM where we had a reverse tunnel from our cloud shell. And now from WSL, we can then tunnel out through all of that to get into the cloud shell, into the remote network. Bada boom, bada bing, we've got access into the network and you can run all your tools then from here. So you don't have to put anything on cloud shell, right? So Let's just do an example with a tool. Let's say we've got, we've got creds for one, that VM. Um, we're gonna use this tool called SC Shell. I just wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Unicoder. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. It basically starts a service that's stopped or in manual mode on a remote computer, changes the binary path, 
and executes whatever command you want, changes it back, service is stopped, everything's restored the way it was. So this is different than like PS exec, where you PS exec, you create a random service name or a service name you, you, uh, you specify, and then it creates the service, runs what you want, stops the service, deletes the service, a lot of IOCs there. So there's some, some IOCs in SC shell. By default, it looks for uh, a service named XLB auth manager. And that's your Xbox Live process that's on your Windows 10 and higher. Thank you, Microsoft, for installing Xbox crap on my Windows PC that I don't need, right? Even in your corporate environment, it's there. So uh, we're going to try that in this case and see if we can connect. All right, so we get an error back. Uh, service does not exist, all right? So that XLB auth manager does not exist on this host. What does that mean? Uh, that means that this probably isn't a standard Windows 10 or 11 host. So we can go to Microsoft documentation and we can go to, so you can see here, Windows Server. If you go to there, you'll see that I've got this ActiveX installer. Now this is a help manual that says, hey, these are the default services installed on Windows Server 2016. And it tells us their startup type. So we see this one as manual. Uh, we can probably start this if it's set in manual and not to, not to start automatically or, or specifically disabled. So we're gonna pick this service, AX inst SV. And we're going to SC shell and specify that service. Boom. So it uh, just kind of validated there that it's a server of some kind. Probably it's got that ActiveX uh, service there that was in manual mode. We changed the bin path, started the service, uh, and now we have a shell. So with SC shell, you have to, it doesn't give you any output. So I use this a lot for lateral movement. I'll put a binary or a DLL or something on the remote system. Uh, or call it from a share or whatever, and then use SC shell to connect. And then you have to do C colon backslash windows system 32 CMD Z C start uh, So something like that, right? Or start where, wherever your payload is. But I use start so that way it detaches and then it runs in its own uh, process and thread and all that stuff. Uh, so this would be your like IOC if you had command line logging going uh, to see this kind of thing coming from a system process, right? Now note if I were to spawn calc like that on the remote system, we wouldn't see it uh, because it's in system context, not a desktop context. All right, so I've shown you that we can proxy through a VNet uh, S, uh, shell, hit it, the VMs on the inside with uh, SC shell. Uh, we hit it with nmap to validate first. Now we have code execution. Let's say we uh, net user add administrator or hacker, right? We added a user to remote desktop users. And now we want to um, remote desktop into that same host. Well, that's the great thing about this SSH tunnel. It's fast and it'll allow you to do so. So I've got my 10.0.0.4 in there, Azure admin. Now what I have running is Proxifier. You can use proxy cap as well, but Proxifier, uh, will proxy specific traffic through that SSH tunnel uh, that you specify. So you specify your SOX proxy here. Go to profile, proxification rules. Now you can see here I've got MSTSC, which is a uh, remote desktop, and dBeaver, which is a database connection tool. And I'll show you that here momentarily. So I've got uh, MSTSC set to proxy through. If I hit connect, there we go. Paste my password. Oh, that connection is smooth as silk through that tunnel, right? And you could even do this, uh, I guess, well, if you had some kind of C2 going, maybe not, because uh, uh, Cloud Shell restricts ports pretty well. So I've already peed in super secret top, super top secret files there, and on to SQL services. So uh, Azure SQL or MS SQL, is pretty uh, important thing. A lot of companies use it, right? They're taking their SQL services from on-prem. Everything's going to the cloud now, including the SQL servers. Uh, so what do I do? I go to GitHub and I'm part of the new beta search. So apparently I get some pretty fancy search queries and stuff like that here now. Uh, but you can search for like database.windows.net, username, password, not username, not SQL server name. So I just took some tags out and specifically specified the C-sharp language. Uh, so let's say, contract you can you can even take out repositories and things like that but let's just say some contractor was working at the company you're targeting and they 
put some code on there. They hard coded some creds into this software. Was, why would anybody do that? But they do. Here you go, Skywalker admin. Right. So we can search uh, GitHub for connection credentials. There you go, database.windows.net. So it's littered. And a lot of these are like students and things like that with temporary projects. But who knows how much of this is valid? I actually have a blog post coming out soon where um, I'm doing some of this research for Azure SQL. So that, look out for that. That'll be fun. So we find creds in here. And then what can we do? How can we connect to it? All that good stuff, right? Well, first of all, let's say we found a connection string for a database in this target Azure's cloud. There is a webinar DB up here. I've got my local shell here. This is not in the cloud. This is my command shell or PowerShell shell uh, in my VM. I'm coming from a DigitalOcean IP. I'm VPN right now through WireGuard. So this is DigitalOcean. If I try to connect from here and select version, what do we get? Coming from the public internet, Windows logins are not supported in this version of SQL Server. Aha. So what does that tell you about this database? A couple things here. We can connect to it or we can hit it from the public internet, right? So that's probably bad. But what happens if we try to log in with credentials from here? Let's say we found some credentials in that, uh, in that string. Go ahead and try to connect. Following along at home, you want to beat up this database. Go for it. But you can't get to it because client with IP address 142, blah, 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 is not allowed to access the server. Enable access, use the Windows Azure Manager portal, or set the firewall. OK, so you can hit it, but, and it's validating credentials, but it's saying you can't uh, connect with uh, these credentials because your IP is, is not in the allow list. All right, so let's talk about SQL. Yes, MS Paint. I just wanted to make sure you could see this. So this is the SQL database server. We're only allowing selected networks. There's nothing in here. There's no firewall rule, no virtual networks allowed. The only thing allowed here is Azure services and resources to access this server. So that totally means only my Azure services and resources can access this server, right? I mean, Microsoft, come on, you wouldn't just allow anybody's tenant to connect to my SQL server, would you? Nah. So let's go ahead and try this. All right, so from, let's first start and validate. We can connect from the company's own SQL. I'm just gonna do this from a second shell since I've got this running. I could have popped uh, the SSH tunnel into Tmux or something, but I didn't. So let's go ahead and try to hit that server from here. All right, a bunch of red. Uh, cannot authenticate using Kerberos. So by default from Cloud Shell, it's gonna default to Kerberos auth. Uh, can you get that working from Cloud Shell? Probably, I would assume so. I have not done that yet. So uh, let's try to connect with creds and pull the version. There we go. We can connect, we can pull the version of SQL. Great. Let's try that from my Cloud Shell. So again, these two tenants are not connected. Let's see what happens. Same thing, Kerberos. So we can hit it just like we could from the outside, get a different error. Now, let's add the uh, connection string. Holy cow, we can connect from my tenant to their tenant uh, and access the database because I found these credentials on GitHub. Have I used this on OP before? Absolutely. Um, and now think about the, the impact of this. If your Azure SQL database, uh, you've got it restricted and only Azure uh, resources can get to it. Well, my resource can get to it. Now, what if you have that linked with a database link to an on-prem database of some sort? Maybe now I can pivot from the cloud through that Azure SQL service down to your, uh, your on-prem environment, right? So a lot of, a lot of security considerations here to think about.